Jason, I really appreciate the songs that you've selected this morning and the matter in which we've engaged in our worship this Lord's Day morning. What a blessing it has been for us to be assembled together. Now, let's open up God's Word again this Lord's Day. Open to the book of 2 Kings, chapter 18. We're going to look at chapters 18 and 19 this morning. We'll be looking at a few other verses here and there, but our study is going to be coming from these chapters. So open your Bible there. You may find it convenient to place a marker there. Uh, we're going to be camping there today as we take a look at some lessons we can learn from Hezekiah's prayer. We always need to be praying, praying without ceasing, and this week has given us some things to be praying for, and we can see in our assembly the answers to those prayers in the presence of some who are with us, who've been released uh, from the hospital, others who are, are back uh, with us, and we're thankful for that and thankful for answered prayer. I want to make mention of one thing very quickly before we dive into our study. Please remember that, Lord willing, next Sunday in this 11 o'clock hour, we're going to be taking a look at what the Bible has to say about depression. It's a topic that has been requested by more than just one member here. Uh, it is something that I believe is of interest to many people, uh, not just in the church, but even those who are outside of the church. So it's an opportunity for you to be thinking of people that you know who'd be interested in, in listening to that sermon, be interested in coming here and attending with us and studying that together, uh, or perhaps listening to it online after it is made available in that format, but, but use it as an opportunity to invite people to come and worship with us. I'm not a trained expert. I'm not a trained counselor. I'm not a trained physician. I cannot address it from that point of view. We're going to be looking at what the Bible has to say about this subject. Lord willing, that is next Sunday morning. Let's look now at Hezekiah. King Hezekiah, he was one of the good kings of the southern kingdom of Judah, but he reigned during a very difficult time, a very turbulent time in the divided kingdom. In the sixth year of his reign, the Assyrians came and carried the northern kingdom of Israel away into captivity. Shortly after that, King Sennacherib of the Assyrians turned his attention to Judah. Verse 13 in 2 Kings chapter 18 says, And in the fourteenth year of King Hezekiah, Sennacherib king of Assyria came up against all the fortified cities of Judah and took them. It's just spoken right there in one verse, but that's a devastating thing that Assyria did. They came down into this small kingdom and they conquered every fortified city. Now. Sennacherib's prism. Uh, Sennacherib is pictured in the upper right hand uh, part of this slide that is a relief that is taken uh, from ancient uh, Nineveh, I believe. Down below is what is called Sennacherib's prism, or also called Taylor's prism. And it is on display in a museum in London, England. And it contains the records of. King Sennacherib and his conquest. And on this prism, there are 46 cities of Judah that are detailed, that are given by name, that Sennacherib conquered. So this, this prism, actually, and the account that we're reading here, archaeology has found some amazing discoveries that shows that the Bible is true and that the Bible is accurate. And, and Sennacherib's prism is one of those. He conquered 46 cities, guarded cities, fortified cities of Judah, and according to this prism, Sennacherib says that he pinned in King Hezekiah in the city of Jerusalem like a bird in a cage. There's some very dark, very turbulent, very troublesome times for the kingdom of Judah. It looks like they are gone. It looks like they are going to be wiped out. Sennacherib, king of Assyria, sent representatives to Jerusalem. 
And they cried out at the wall in the hearing of the people there in the city, delivering a message from Sennacherib that was meant to intimidate the people into surrendering. Yes, they had the military power to come in to build siege walls around and to starve that city out and conquer it, but it'd be much easier if they would just surrender. And so the the letter is sent, or these representatives are sent, and they stand and they cry out, to in the hearing of the people of the city, and they they are trying to intimidate them. And what they do, the message that is sent to them from King Sennacherib, is a message that challenged their trust and their confidence. Look at verse 18. Thus says the great king, the king of Assyria, what confidence is this in which you trust? you're taking notes in your Bible and you like to mark your Bible, this might be a good verse for you to highlight. That's what this is all about. Where are you going to put your trust? Where are you going to put your confidence? And and, uh, this, this king, Sennacherib, is challenging Hezekiah and challenging the Jews, the citizens of Jerusalem, Quit putting your confidence in things that will not work. And it goes on in verse 20, don't put your confidence in your military power because you don't have any. As a matter of fact, a little bit later in the chapter, a challenge is going to be posed. We would give you 2,000 horses, but you don't have enough men to put on them to fight against us. So they had no military power. And don't put your confidence in Egypt. It's very clear that the Assyrians have some intelligence about the things that are going on in Judah. And so these things are brought out in in this message from Sennacherib. We know about the alliance that you've made with Israel. They're like a broken reed. If you're leaning on them and depending on them, it's going to break and it's going to go through your hand. Egypt isn't going to come through for you. And don't put your confidence in your God. Because your God cannot save you. None of the rest of the gods have been able to save the countries that we've come up against. We've wiped them all out. Your God is no different than those gods. Don't put your confidence in Hezekiah. Don't let him tell you that we're going to trust in God and he's going to deliver us because he won't. Things didn't look good for this city. Things didn't look good for Hezekiah. Well, Hezekiah sent word to the prophet Isaiah and asked Isaiah to pray to God for this matter. And Isaiah sent back word from the Lord. In chapter 19, verses 6 and 7, And Isaiah said to them, Thus you shall say to your master, Thus says the Lord, Do not be afraid of the words which you have heard, with which the servants of the king of Assyria have blasphemed me. See, this king is not only putting down Hezekiah and putting down his weak military and his inability to bring any uh, allies to come in to help him, he's putting down Hezekiah's God. He's blasphemed God. And God says, I've heard it. I know exactly what's going on. Don't be afraid. But God goes one step further than that. God doesn't just say, don't be afraid, I've got it taken care of. He gives some details. Here's what I'm going to do. Surely I will send a spirit upon him, and he shall hear a rumor and return to his own land, and I will cause him to fall by the sword in his own land. So, Hezekiah has been reassured. God has this matter under control. Well, when, when the representatives got back to Lachish and saw that Sennacherib now was gone, you see, when you're, when you're taking over the world, you can't focus just on one country. Well, some other enemies have popped up over here, and so Sennacherib has to send some of his forces over there. We can't, we can't mess with Jerusalem anymore. They just need to surrender They just need to surrender, and and then we can move our attention on to other things. And so Sennacherib sends a letter. He sends a letter back to Jerusalem, back to Hezekiah, and and in in essence, intimidating him to surrender. 
Here's a portion of that letter. It says, Do not let your God in whom you trust deceive you, saying, Jerusalem shall not be given into the hand of the king of Assyria. Again, I find it interesting. They've got some intelligence network going on there. They've got some spies. They know what's happening there in Judah. Don't listen to this. Don't listen to what your God has told you. Look, you have heard what the kings of Assyria have done to all the lands by utterly destroying them. And shall you be delivered? No, you're going to fall just like everyone else is going to fall. Just surrender. Make it easy on yourself. Just surrender. This is a very troubling time. A very troubling time for Judah, what's left of it. A very troubling time for Jerusalem. A very troubling time for Hezekiah. Think about this. The promise that God made to Abraham. That threefold promise. That nation, the northern kingdom is gone. The southern kingdom is just one city left. The land has been devoured by the, the, the Ninevites, this, this nation. And now here's this little remnant. The seed promise is at threat. It looks like it's lights out. It looks like this is the end. What does King Hezekiah do about this situation? How did he respond to this threat? There's some things that we need to learn from Hezekiah. And the way he responds to this threat teaches us some lessons. You and I are not kings. We're not responsible for a nation or for a city. Best, we're responsible for our lives, for our homes. Maybe if you own a business, you're responsible for that. So our responsibility is not quite on the scale of Hezekiah, but yet there's some lessons here to learn. How did he handle this tragedy? How did he handle this crisis? What are some lessons that we can learn from it today? Four things I want to point out about King Hezekiah. Number one really goes back to before all of this started, and that is that Hezekiah started out close to God. Hezekiah, when all of this began, Hezekiah was already close to God. He didn't wait until trouble came to get God's number and look him up and see if he could help. He wasn't a last-ditch resort. No, Hezekiah started out close to God. Look with me at 2 Kings chapter 18. Now let's start at verse 2. Let's start at verse 2. It says he was 25 years old when he became king, and he reigned 29 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Abby, the daughter of Zechariah. And he did what was right in the sight of the Lord according to all that his father had done. He removed the high places and broke down the sacred pillars, cut down the wooden image and broke in pieces the bronze serpent that Moses had made. For until those days, the children of Israel burned incense to it and called it Nehushtan. Let's pause right here. What this verse is telling us is that Hezekiah is leading reforms and he's getting rid of idolatry. He's stamping out idolatry. And notice what has become an idol. Here's how bad Judah has gotten. Here's how bad Judah has gotten. That bronze serpent that Moses crafted all the way back in Numbers chapter 21 has by this time turned into an idol. And the people of Judah are worshiping it as an idol. That's how bad things have gotten. And Hezekiah destroys that. So he's standing up for God. He's doing what he can to remove idolatry. Verse 5, he trusted in the Lord God of Israel so that after him was none like him among the kings of Judah, nor who were before him. For he held fast to the Lord. He did not depart from following him, but kept his commandments which the Lord had commanded Moses. The Lord was with him, and he prospered wherever he went, and he rebelled against the king of Assyria and did not serve him. He's already close to God. He's trusting in the Lord. He's holding fast to the Lord. He's keeping His commandments. The text says there wasn't another king like him. And there were some pretty pitiful kings in Judah, but there were some good ones too. But Hezekiah is held up. One of the best. He is a man who is close to God. He's zealous for God's honor. Now, he wasn't a perfect man. You stay right here in chapter 18. You see he makes a terrible mistake. 
the, the first thing he does is, is he tries to appease Assyria, tries to appease Sennacherib by paying tribute to him. And he goes and he ransacks the temple of God, takes out all the silver, strips the gold off the doors, and sends all that to Sennacherib, thinking that Sennacherib's going to be an honest man, he's going to take that tribute, and he's going to back off. And what Sennacherib did is he said, thank you very much for that gold, and proceeded to destroy 46 cities of Judah. And so, Hezekiah's learned a lesson here. This man can't be trusted. This man can't be trusted. So, but he's made some mistakes, but he still he's a man who is very close to God. Hezekiah was not a, a stranger to God, and God was not a stranger to him when a crisis came in his life. He was able to depend on God in a time of great tragedy because he had walked with God in his daily life. I wonder how many of us seek to have that kind of a relationship with God. Or how many of us know we should be doing that, but we, we somehow we've got God, we've got His emergency number. And I really don't have room for you in my life right now, God. I don't have time for you, and I don't have room for you in my life right now, but if things ever get bad, I know where I can go. Think God's glorified by that? When Jesus went into the Garden of Gethsemane to pray on the night that he was betrayed, he, he prayed there, Father, if it be your will, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not what I will, but, but your will be done. Poured out his heart to God in prayer there and found the strength there that he needed to go forward with obeying the Father. But what the Gospels tell us is that was not the first time he prayed to God. As we're reading Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, we see Jesus is constantly praying to the Father, so that when it comes a time that he really needs him, he's close to him already. Is your God a God who is nearby, or is your God a God who is far away? Tragedy is going to come to us all. Crisis is going to come in our lives. We need to get close to God now. That was one thing that was going well for Hezekiah. He started out close to God. Secondly, notice that he went to the house of God. Now we're in chapter 19 and at verse 14. Chapter 19 and at verse 14, Sennacherib has sent this letter that we need, to, we need to get them to hurry up and to surrender. God is not going to save you. You need to surrender to us and spare your lives. Look at verse 14. And Hezekiah received the letter from the hand of the messengers and read it. And Hezekiah went up to the house of the Lord. The first thing that he did when he got this threatening letter is he went to the house of the Lord. What a sad thing it is, at times in, in, in my life, I've seen crises happen to Christians. I've seen them go through different kinds of tragedy. And, and when it does, they're absent from the assembly. They don't go to church. And the rationale is this, how could anyone expect me to go to church with this going on? Surely I'm excused. Surely the elders don't expect me, the members don't expect me to, to, to pull myself together and to clean myself up and to get myself dressed and presentable and go to worship and act like everything's okay. I'll be there, I'll be back when everything is all right. What a mistake that is. There's no better place for you to be when things are going wrong in your life then right here where you are right now. Worshiping God side by side with your brethren. That's the place where you need to be. I know I've related this before. I'll continue to do so. When we were in Edna, Texas, we found out early on a Sunday morning that one of our members there had lost his wife. She, they were both faithful members there. He was serving as one of our deacons. She was having some health problems. She lost her life in the early morning of that Sunday morning. And we got word from, from his relatives, and honestly, we didn't expect to see him that day. 
and he walked in. He walked in and he got a reception you would not believe. He got what he needed from his brethren that day. Where else would you rather be? Where else would you rather go? When you're sick, you don't wait till you're better to go to the doctor. Well, maybe you do, but most people don't. When your car breaks down, you don't wait till it's running again to take it to the mechanic. You don't wait till the fire goes out to call the fire department. You don't wait till the tragedy goes away to look up God. Well, where do you go? You go to God. You need to know, go to God. In, in Psalm 18 and at verse 2, Psalm 18 and verse 2, we're spending some time in the Psalms in our 930 hour, looking at the, the style of the writing, looking at the Hebrew poetry. I love this verse, Psalm 18, verse 2. It's as if the, the writer has gotten the thesaurus and he's pulled out every possible word that he can and he stacks them one on top of the other to talk about what he has found in God. Psalm 18 and at verse 2, The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, my God, my strength and whom I will trust, my shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. Where else would you rather be? And with a God like that, I was glad when they said to me, let us go into the house of the Lord, Psalm 122 and at verse 1. In the book of Hebrews, at chapter 4, verses 14 through 16, Hebrews 4, verses 14 through 16, Seeing then that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. Where else would you rather go than to God? Where else would you rather go than to God's people? Still here in Hebrews, at chapter 3, verses 12 and 13, Beware, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God, but exhort one another daily while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. And to reread what we read this morning at the table, Hebrews chapter 10, verses 24 and 25, And let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. And when things are going bad, when we've got tragedy, when we've got crisis, we need to go to God. And we need to go to God's. But notice what else Hezekiah shows us. Look at what he did in the house of God. In 2 Kings chapter 19, I didn't read the whole verse. He got this letter. He read it. He went up to the house of the Lord and spread it before the Lord. I love that gesture. I doubt this picture does it any credit at all. I imagine it was on a scroll. Now imagine he took that scroll and just laid it out there in the floor of the temple as far in as he was able to go, not being a Levite. And he laid it out there before the Lord as if to say, do something about this. Do something about this. He had a great faith in God's care and God's interest for this situation. And likewise, the best thing that we can do with our troubles and our difficulties is to take them and lay them out before God. In the Old Testament, this admonition is worded this way. In Psalm 55 and verse 22. Psalm 55 and at verse 22. Cast your burden on the Lord and He shall sustain you. He shall never permit the righteous to be moved. David wrote this before Hezekiah. No doubt Hezekiah knew it. And he was doing it. He was casting this before the Lord. The equivalent in the New Testament is 1 Peter chapter 5 and at verse 7. 1 Peter 5 verse 7, Casting all your care upon Him, 
for He cares for you. That's what God wants us to do. These things that are troubling us, these emergencies that we have, take them to God and cast them on God. Take them off yourself and give them to God. And of course, we do that through prayer. We do that through our prayers. When we do like Jesus has told us, and we go into our inner room and we shut the door, and it's there that we open up to God in prayer, it is there that we unburden ourselves. We take these things to God, and in our prayer, we are spreading them out to God. Someone, from time to time, you hear people say, well, why do you need to pray unto God? God knows everything. And if God knows everything, then He knows what we need before we ask it. Why do we need to ask it? It's in the act of praying unto God that we find the relief that we need. In Philippians chapter 4, verses 6 and 7, Philippians 4, verses 6 and 7, Be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. Take them and roll them out before God. Spread them out before God. Cast your burdens on the Lord. What's the promise? And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Just like God guarded the city of Jerusalem, and gave it peace during the time of the threat from Sennacherib. God can guard your heart and your life. But you have to pray. It's in the process of praying that we get these things off of our hearts. It's in the process of praying that we find comfort in knowing that we don't have to carry these burdens any longer. It's the process of praying that can be very therapeutic to us as we actually say the things that are troubling us, say them out loud and work through those things through prayer. It's where we find that relief. That's where we find that comfort. God has made it clear that He wants us to bring our troubles to Him in prayer so that we can find strength and we can find relief. We need to follow Hezekiah's example. We need to go to God in prayer. Then I want to spend a moment looking at His prayer. How do we learn how to pray? We learn how to pray oftentimes through example. And we listen to the men at church pray, or we listen to people in our family pray as we're growing up. But one way as Christians we can better develop our prayers is by listening to the people in the Bible pray. And the prayer that's offered by Hezekiah here is an excellent model of prayer for us. Let's take a look, 2 Kings 19. Verses, verses 15 through 19. Verses 15 through 19. Then Hezekiah prayed before the Lord and said, O Lord God of Israel, the one who dwells between the cherubim, you are God, you alone. Of all the kingdoms of the earth, you have made heaven and earth. Incline your ear, O Lord, and hear. Open your eyes, O Lord, and see. And hear the words of Sennacherib, which he has sent to reproach the living God. Truly, Lord, the kings of Assyria have laid waste the nations and their lands, and have cast their gods into the fire. For they were not gods, but the work of men's hands, wood and stone. Therefore they destroyed them. Now therefore, O Lord our God, I pray, save us from his hand that all the kingdoms of the earth may know that you are the Lord God, you alone. I want to notice some things about this prayer. Number one, the first thing that Hezekiah did was he stated his belief in God's majesty and his power in verse 15. That's where he began. You are the God of Israel. You are the one who dwells between the cherubim. You alone are God. And he stated his trust and his confidence in God and God's power. Verse 16, incline your ear, open your eyes, hear the words of reproach, and do something about it. Do something about this. He stated his belief in God's sovereignty 
over the idols of the nations. Yes, Sennacherib comes in and he boasts, no other God's been able to protect their nations. Yes, but our God is not like their God. You are the true and the living God. Yes, these nations fell. Their gods are idols. But you are the true and living God. And then, notice this. He didn't say, save us. He didn't say, please deliver us. Please deliver me. He said, defend your name. Defend your name and defend your honor. It has been be reproached by the most powerful king of the most powerful nation on the earth. Defend your name and your honor. You notice something about this prayer? This prayer is God-centered, not self-centered. Recently in our, our Sunday morning Bible class, we looked at the, the uh, Pharisee and the tax collector going to the temple to pray in Luke chapter 18. And remember the prayer of the Pharisee. I thank you that I'm not like these other people and here's who I am and here's what I do and it's all about me. That wasn't Hezekiah's prayer at all. Hezekiah's prayer is it's all about you. We can learn something from that. We can learn something about that from that, and we need to learn to keep God in the center of our prayers of praise and thanksgiving, and yes, even of supplication. Keep God in the center of those prayers. The effective fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. And I'll tell you, this prayer works. Look in verse 20. Verse 20 says, Then Isaiah the son of Amos sent to Hezekiah, saying, Thus says the Lord God of Israel, Because you have prayed to me against Sennacherib, king of Assyria, I have heard. I have heard. And then the chapter goes on where God is going to reveal what He's going to do and how He's going to defend His name and His glory. And then, I want us to look at how God has delivered Jerusalem and how God delivered Hezekiah. Look at the very end of chapter 19, verses 35 through 37. If you're, if you're a Bible student and you like the action, well, this is it. If you like the idea of taking these Bible accounts and making movies out of them, well, then here's the big scene from your movie. This is it. Look at verse 35. And it came to pass on a certain night that the angel of the Lord went out and killed in the camp of the Assyrians 185,000. And when people arose early in the morning, there were the corpses all dead. So Sennacherib king of Assyria departed and went away, returned home, and remained at Nineveh. Isn't that what God said he was going to do? God said, don't worry about it. He's not even going to come to the city. He's going to turn around and he's going to go home. And God made that happen. He made that happen by sending the angel and in one night killed. 185,000. They woke up the next morning. They're dead. There's no explanation for it. They're dead. I've been told, I've not done the study and research, but I've been told that in the writings of the Assyrians, they, they had the idea, they had the report that a plague broke out. A plague broke out. But, but here's the greatest army in the world at that time, decimated. It's gone. And Sennacherib ducks his tail tucks his tail between his legs, and he scurries back home in defeat. The most powerful man in the world, the great and mighty Sennacherib, defeated by God. Think about, think about the plagues, and think about the deliverance of Egypt, or uh, Israel from Egypt, rather. There, that nation of slaves defeated the most powerful nation of that day, without firing a shot. God delivered them. Here, the remnant in Judah is delivered without firing a shot. When God gives deliverance, He gives deliverance. But look at verse 37. Verse 37. Now, now you remember what, what God promised. In, if you back up to verse 7 in chapter 19, 
Surely I will send a spirit upon him, and he shall hear a rumor and return to his own land, and I will cause him to fall by the sword in his own land. Look at verse 37. Now it came to pass, as he was worshiping in the temple of Nishrach, his God, that his sons, Dramalek and Sherezer, struck him down with the sword. Remember I told you the last hour to hang on to that, to that theme of two men going to the temple to pray? Because in 2 Kings 19, we have two men going to the temple to pray. We have Hezekiah who goes to the temple of God that he trusts, and he prays, and God gives him deliverance. And we have Sennacherib who goes to the temple of his God and it's there that he's killed by the sword by his own sons. His own sons. What a shameful death for a man who dared to boast against the true and living God. Our God delivers. and He gives great deliverance. And you and I may never face a threat like this in our lives, but we have the same God who's watching out for us. So there are some great lessons for us to learn from this passage. We need to do like Hezekiah. We need to follow his example. We're not kings responding to national threats. But how do we respond when things threaten our marriage? When things threaten our home life, the livelihood and lives of our children, when things threaten the local church of which we are a member, when things threaten our reputations, when things threaten our relationship with God, how do we handle those things? Hezekiah teaches us that we take them to God. We maintain our confidence in God. I'm glad this account is found here, not just in 2 Kings. It's also tucked away in the book of Isaiah as well. It's recorded a number of times, and when the Bible does that, there's a reason. There's something we really need to learn from those accounts. I've been excited about this study. been looking forward to share this with you, and I appreciate the way in which you followed along. I know you've been following. I know that you've been learning. Let us take these truths and let's make application of them to our lives today. If you're not a Christian today, you need to become one. And you don't do so by going to the house of the Lord and praying. You do so by responding to the gospel. Jesus came and shed His blood to wash away your sins. And that salvation, that forgiveness is available to you if you believe that Jesus is the Son of God. Repent of your sins, confess your faith, and be baptized in water to have those sins washed away. The God who gives deliverance has made a way to deliver you from your sin if you will just take it. If you're subject to the invitation, we invite you to come as we stand and sing this invitation.